Uh, I'm speaking for most of you here. The last session, uh, JC, Dave, Daniel, and Samuel were amazing. I think the perfect talks which are very balanced, rational, evidence-based, and I know it can be confusing, especially to the younger crowd, where we are debating inlay, onlay, uh, subscap, no subscap, but it is very important that this churning happen and we discuss here, there has to be a cross-fertilization idea and you must hear our ideas bouncing against each other because all of us have our own experience. We each work with a different prosthesis, but this is the current turmoil we are going through and all of us need to be awake to these arguments because we are all, whether we want to or we don't want to, all of us are going to be doing a lot more reverse shoulders than conventional prosthesis. And uh, we're in the middle of a big revolution and you can take it down from me that there will be a complete revolution of reverse shoulders in the next 10 years. Uh, what revolution was initiated almost 30, 40 years back by the French and it was largely the monomania of one person who insisted that the reverse is going to work. And uh, Gramont, you have no idea when in those days what he must have been fighting because such an unconventional and such a unorthodox prosthesis which is now becoming norm. So there's a sea change of information going on. Um, we will move forward and uh, I really want to impress upon those of you who are still raw at this and thinking that why is there so much con discussion going on? It's a very valid, pertinent discussion that ought to, and that's why we kept this uh, presentation here. Do we have a presentation here? Okay. Um, I think, yeah. I just need to come here. Lovely. So, <clears throat> this was not there in the original talk, but since uh, Basam backed out, it was important for me to fill up all the spaces, so we thought it's another thing that we must, uh, we must cover, and it's a very important topic, and especially in our scenario in this country, we would be doing a lot more reverses for fractures rather than uh, for conventional elective arthritis. So most of us make this argument that if it's a proximal humerus fracture, it's going to be a philosophic session because the lock plate has revolutionized the management of proximal humerus fractures. My contention is otherwise. The lock plate has made it too easy. And that is why we are taking it for granted and we have seen a spate of complications because of the lock plate. And uh, Shirish, in fact, has done a big justice to that topic uh, at the workshop because this is something that we have been experiencing. We're doing too many revisions of lock plates as such. So we should be aware that there are a lot many problems with the lock of loss or the lock plate as a whole. And you must understand that there are 25% re-operations from Brunner there's a 45% complication rate, and screw penetration remains the commonest complication, 22%. Every month, I revise about four or five lock plates every month, and it's a pain. It really is a pain, it's unfair to the patient. But we need to open up, accept, because this is the published literature, this is the fact, okay? So don't miss that. This is Ausley's report back 2008. Uh, elderly patients above 60, there's a very unexpectedly high complication rate. The axial nerve, don't disregard the axial nerve because uh, this was McLaughlin study, it's a dated study, but still 58% EMGs in all his proximal humerus fracture patients, 58% altered currents. Almost all did recover, but some of them don't. The deltoid split approach, those who are fans of the deltoid split approach, Please read this Westfall study published in Jan 2017, 20% axial nerve injuries because of the deltoid split approach for proximal humerus fractures. So do be careful. You must understand that we will debate about this later, but it started with a MIS, then it went to a open, then it went to axial nerve exposure, slide the plate on the axial nerve. You must understand why did that flow happen? Because there are disasters. If the axial nerve is gone, it's game over. 
if you did a deltopectoral and didn't fit well, you had AVN, the, uh, there was non-union, it's still salvageable. If the axis nerve is gone, it's over. You just have to say goodbye. Uh, again, there's a lot of publication in favor of the reverse shoulder in fixation of fractures in patients above 75. I won't go through all of those in detail. This is one of our 81-year-old lady, three-part fracture, very alert, intelligent South Indian lady, and this looks eminently fixable, you would have thought, and you looked at the CT scan, and you must always get CT scan for these comminuted proximal humerus fractures. These are intra-articular fractures. I would do a CT scan for every proximal tibia intra-articular fracture. I would do the same for my proximal humerus fractures. But in this age group, you have no control over the quality of the bone. The rotator cuff is fired. The results are directly proportional to the quality of the cuff. So the x-ray might look good, but the patient function is going to be extremely poor and tardy. So you don't want revision surgeries at this age. The sensible thing to do is go ahead and do a primary reverse shoulder in these patients. Her ADLs were restored. She's managing her son's company's finances even now. Uh, she's a two and a half year follow-up right now. Uh, she has a reasonable movement, 120, 120, 40, L5. Uh, but this is what is done, and that's a fracture stem for you. So you must try to use a fracture stem in fractures. That's very important. But that's for another day, not pertinent to this talk. Now look at this 65-year-old lady who fell from 10 feet eight months before reporting to us. Complete disability shows conserved. Conserved based on this x-ray. June 2016 looks nice, looks OK, and it's falling apart. And the main problem here is at no point in time in those eight months did the surgeon ever think of doing a lateral x-ray. I bet you my bottom dollar, the lateral x-ray, the head was in one direction, the shaft was in another direction. So my first plea to all of you is number one take home message, always do a lateral. And if you can't, just do a CT scan. And this is the status that she comes to us eight months after with that non-union and that head has completely mushroomed it. And now it's difficult. Now it's difficult. It's very difficult. And the cuff is there, but it's going to fire, it's going to function. So you just want one surgery for these patients. And you can see the amount of disability she has. There are no rotations at all because all the cuff is attached to it. It was a straightforward fracture, almost a two-part fracture. And a lot of pain, a lot of disability. You can see the shoulder elevation there. And this is seven months post-op, primary reverse shoulder replacement. So that is the kind of difference you can make on these patients. But I mean, there's no reason for us to do a reverse shoulder on her. She was eminently fixable. But uh, again, the fundamentals were not there. Proceeding forwards, another elderly lady looks like a straight for fracture, no axials done. I agree, poor technique, wrong application, correct implant, should have been done better. And when you leave the GT off, we're dealing with three very complex GT off patients right now. Yesterday, between Dave and JC, we examined an 18-year-old patient who's eight months off fixation done. GT is missed out. He has a complete drop arm, zero. There's no GT there, and there's no cuff. And I have no solution for him. And he's only 18 years old. But this lady was 72, and she's a parent of doctors who are based in England and had to rush back in and we had to do a revision surgery. You don't want to do two surgeries at ladies this age who are 72. And uh, you have to repair the GT and LT to give a stable envelope on these patients, whereas in normal cuff tear arthropathy, you would ignore the supraspinatus. And that sometimes the GT does get ossified completely. And this is one of our first cases that we did. She's a five-year follow-up and doing reasonably well. So we've salvaged her. But uh, it was, again, a bit too much to do. This is interesting patient because she's 72 years. She had fracture proximal humerus bilateral at different timelines. Uh, he's very poorly fit, cardiac output 30%. This was the left side, looks good, fixable. This is the right side, very porotic, came much later, three years after the first one, and she had gold old. Because she was a cardiac patient, we didn't want to risk. Uh, when she came in first on the left side, we did a fixation because straight two-part fracture, no argument. Even if she's 72, I would do what is best done. And we're not pushing and selling the reverse here at all. But when she comes two years later and then 
she's cardiac out to poor, and that's a very porotic bone. We knew that it was porotic. We've done a reverse. The funny thing is, her ranges are pretty equal on both sides, and there's very little to compare between the plate and the. I'm not sure this is going to play. Uh, you'll have to take it from me that the range of movement is pretty similar on both sides, but she's much more happier pain-free on the right reverse side because her cuff is very poor at her age. And so she keeps harping that her right side is much better than she wanted a reverse on the left side. This is a young gentleman, and uh, he had a proximal humerus fixation, KVAR done, then a proximal humerus fixation done, and uh, finally went into painful non-union, came to us, uh, with a non-union. This was nine months after the initial surgery, and his only request was, don't give me all this gibberish. We tried to explain the reverse shoulder to him. He said, just take me out and get rid of my pain. He was fed up with the pain and very poor function, and he was so much in pain that he didn't want his movement. He said, just get rid of the pain. It was difficult to get rid of your pain. I won't go into his details because we don't have time, but uh, this is almost... This is the pre-op, uh, same day of surgery, and this is almost two and a half months, and he's on his own. The reverse patients will rehabilitate themselves much better. Some of the younger ones are incredibly impressive, and the most important thing is 90% pain gone, 10% still there because he's lost his anterior deltoid from the oh, open scar that was done. So patients above 75, uh, we would do a primary reverse shoulder, by and large, in most of the patients, certainly not all the patients, but you have to be careful. You need to look for axial nerve palsy because if you do a reverse shoulder in axial nerve palsy, it will be a disaster. So you must actively check for deltoid. It's uh, inconceivable to do a good EMG study in these patients. The tuberosities actually heal better in the reverse than in the hemiarthroplasty. So it's a good design because that gives an envelope of stability to these patients. But ensure that these are osteoporotic patients and they don't have an associated glenoid fracture and acromion fracture. That will be a massive, massive embarrassing situation because in the presence of a glenoid fracture, putting in the process is going to be a nightmare. Acromion fracture would just go into non-union, so be very careful. We still don't know what is the earliest age for a reverse shoulder replacement, but I think well, 75 physiological and above, I would still do it. Again, these are evidences where the reverse shoulder at five years was better than a hemiarthroplasty in forward flexion. Galinet's case, the constant score, dash scores was better, and Gehrig's uh, 2012 report. The reverse was better, but the rotations with the reverse are much poorer. The reverse, especially the current or the previous designs, were not appropriate for reverse. This is probably the only balanced study where it was randomized on Porsada, where it, he compared hemi versus reverse in similar populations. And the worst outcomes were in tuberosity failures, especially in the hemis. The huge 34% proximal migration in hemi patients. And that's a game over situation. And then that's straight revision there. And the revision of hemi to reverses was almost 13%. But the revisions don't give you the same result as the primary reverse as such. So poor rotations here that you can see in reverse patients. But the forward flexion, the ACS scores, and constant scores are much better. So in conclusion, uh, the reverse is a viable alternative, 70 years and above. Uh, established results, but there are more complex issues. I don't think at the current rate that there are any cost efficiency rationale, especially in a country in India where we don't have an insurance population. So it is a very expensive option, and that's something that works against giving these patients a good results. And sure, the results of the best RSRs are not as good as the hemiarthroplasties as such, and the reverse in CTA, cuffter arthropathy, is far superior to the reverse in fractures. Thank you very much. Uh, we should take questions. I'm sure there are, and we have enough time for the questions. Uh, the last session especially. Um, for the previous faculty. Yes, more uh, Karthi. Question to Dr. Antuna. Um, so um, the equinox prosthesis, it's a medialized glenoid, right? As, as far as the humerus is concerned, it's lateralized. But what so, happens on, on the glenoid side? So the, the humeral component is lateralized, 
and the glenoid component is lateralized only two millimeters from the face of the glenoid. So the, conf the concept of the equinox is lateralization of the humeral component and uh, a standard base plane, not, not lateralized. Although, if you need that, there is an expanded glenosphere in, in which case, if you use that, you would have a lateralized glenosphere and a lateralized humerus as well. When we use a large glenosphere. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But the concept is lateralization of the humerus. Ram. I got a question for you as well. Uh, all the other systems we use seem to have a circular base plate or an elliptical base plate with a central peg fixation in the middle. That more, more, looks more sensible, but only Xactac has got a slightly bit superior located central peg device. I, any rationale behind it? Yeah, I did not decide that base plate, but I think that is clever because the cage always goes where the best bone in the glenoid is. You may think that it has some disadvantages in revision cases because it, when the bone loss is very uh, deficient, you may have to use uh, a screw for fixation, but since the system has a long cage, which is thin, uh, most of the revision cases can be solved with it. So the rationale behind using an eccentric base plate with the post up in the upper part is to get the better fixation. And in most of your uh, post-op fixation, I noticed that all the screws are longer. In the debut or in the uh, earlier prosthesis, we couldn't even put the anterior-posterior screws. Is that yeah. because of your navigation control? Some of them are, some not. But right. in the cases you saw with the long screws, it was because there was bone graft in the back, so you needed, right. you needed a, a long fixation. Okay. So as long as you get enough fixation with your screws, you don't need very long screws. And the other thing which is important to recognize is that if you use this system, the upper screw that initially was going through, uh, through the uh, base of the, uh, towards the coracoid process, uh, we don't use it anymore because it has been seen that some of these patients develop pain posteriorly Mm -hmm. and even some of them acromial fractures. So if you get, it, it allows you six screws, but usually we use four, but now we try to avoid the upper one. Thank you. Yes, yeah, uh, my question is uh, Dr. Antuna. Um, you had uh, shown a slide about the revision uh, shoulder replacement and in which you mentioned uh, the degree of version of the glenoid and the anti-verted glenoids, there were, there were hardly any which got revised. Uh, I don't know whether you, is that what the slide mentioned or yeah. did I read it, it, it was wrong? not It was not uh, revision, it was, it was the degree of version changes in primary reverses and you're right, anti-verted glenoids are very uncommon, very uncommon. Most of the glenoids that we deal with are within the range of zero degrees of version towards 20 degrees of retroversion. But antiverted glenoids are very uncommon. So my question is, uh, if you have a B2 or a B3 glenoid where you are trying to uh, correct the uh, posterior retroversion, uh, why don't we add a couple of more degrees uh, to eight degrees to make it a little antiverted? You mean for the base plate, for the equinox, for the plate, why yeah. it's only eight degrees? No, why can't we make it, uh, say, nine degrees or 10 degrees, which would then bring it in a little bit of anti-version. It would probably then reduce the rates of uh, revision in the glenoid. Oh, okay, so I didn't, so the question is, why don't we overcorrect the yeah, retroversion? Well, because we don't know that overcorrection is gonna be better than zero retroversion. We don't even know if zero version is better than 10 degrees retroversion in the, in, the, in the reverse shoulder replacement. So we are aiming for perfection without knowing what perfection is. Right. I think uh, you should also remember there are a lot of confounding factors, other factors which can affect the complication rate in these studies, not only one uh, degree or parameter, you know, just for the audience. Dave? 
Can I ask you to come in here and sit in front of us uh, at the front bench here? Thank you. Um, we'll quickly wrap up with a case discussion scenario. I'm going to use this first bench as my target audience because this looks like the most intellectual, full of gray cell, experienced kind of uh, team. Dumb, dumb Sam, uh, you're part of the team, so we're going to show you a few case scenarios just to lighten up the scene. And uh, we'll, we'll like to have the elite opinion of such experienced faculty here. So we'll just do three or four cases so that we can wrap up in time. This is interesting. This is a young 22-year-old male epileptic. He's had anterior dislocations for two years, and he's had no seizures for the last 10 months since he saw us. And inability to throw, he's a cricket player. He has mid-range apprehension probably heading towards a glenoid bone loss. Range of movement is full. The hairy test was positive on the left side. Uh, right side was 80, sorry. And the drawers was positive as well. On the x-ray, if you look closely, uh, you will see that the double cortical sign was positive, hinting that there is a significant glenoid bone loss. Radiologists reported 28% glenoid bone loss in a 22-year-old epileptic who's controlled. So the question was that, what should we have offered? So I'm going to make this easy for you, just this one bit. And uh, this patient was poor. We posted him for an arthral attache. And we, we operated him live arthral attache at the Jaipur Indian Arthroscopy Society meeting. And JC was there and uh, went through well, um, went smooth. This gentleman uh, was so happy after surgery that he was moving his arms free. We told him no major restriction, skipped his anti-epileptic medications, came back from Jaipur to Pune, and on the very eighth day post-op, had a massive seizures and re-dislocated. And so the primary problem was not what to be do, but this was the problem. And uh, he ripped out that entire graft. He was just eight days post-op. JC, have you seen this scenario before? Um, not eight days, but I had a almost same patient a uh, couple of months, or was it one or two years within, almost same x-ray like that. Um, I think, I don't know, I don't know the answer, but first thing would be he has to control that epileptic or so. Whatever we do is beyond our, his power. This he was controlled 10 months before surgery, yeah, yeah, no yeah. episode. But like this case is kind of un, un, unusual because it's right after da. eight days. But they, they control and then sometimes they don't. And then one year later, they, do, they have the same, same issue. So yeah. uh, epileptic, uh, whether bone loss or not, I think is the most difficult patients. But if they control that epilepsy, if they control, it, yeah, yes. they, they're OK. Yeah. So let's presume that he's going to control. What do we do for him now? Um, do you, if you have a CT, if you can still use the coracoid that's remaining, I, I went in, if you, I, went, I had a two cases that I went in and then the coracoid was reusable. Yes, So we're so presuming I, it's reusable, so but there he, are broken fragments inside there. Um, He's broken the screws. Well, the, you take out the screws and, and you, you put the uh, you put the bone if it's probably what you could do a Bristol, not not ladder J, mm. just mm. one screw. But you think you can get hold of those screw ends? It's broken in the shaft. Oh, the the, the bones that's the screw that's inside. Just leave it alone. I don't. So you just leave it alone. Yeah, just the ones that are outside. Yeah, yeah. Dave, you have anything to offer? Um, I, I also have a patient or two very similar. You do? And I find most of the time that you can get the graft and reuse it. Um, and that would be my plan. I wouldn't care about the screw fractured parts in the bone. I'd just ignore those. Um, I would be prepared to do a distal tibial osteochondral graft in a 22-year-old if the bone wasn't good enough. So I'd have that available. I'm suddenly feeling very nice because <laughs> I thought it was only me <laughs> who suffered all these problems. Looks like JC, Dave, all, we are all in the same boat. Um, Boof. Ash, I, I sent you the x-ray last week, and it's not very dissimilar to this. 
Uh, my only question is, David, if you go inside and then if you find that there's a split or quote unquote is not uh, usable, then we need to be uh, prepared for allograph, what Dave was saying. I was saying. So I used uh, last week, um, I had a good femoral head with the neck, and the neck was such a good graft, better than I thought tibial graft, uh, the coronal and sagittal. And then the beauty of it is if I had failed with one part of the neck, they had another neck as well and fits so well with two screws and, and mm. I, that looked pretty good. So I did femoral neck allograft. Yeah. Your x-ray didn't have much coracoid on it, so it was a sloppy job and there was only one screw floating around. That's different. Here this was fresh off the coast. So well, it was not my fault it was done. Yeah. You yeah. know where it was yeah. done. So. We'll come back. We'll come back. Uh, as Dave suggested, in America they have allografts which are uh, tibial allograft, so they can be on the side. But we consented him for a uh, ILAC crest bone graft SOS in case the coracoid was unusable. You can do this re-arthroscopic latage, but uh, this fellow has run out of money, and we just wanted to do this quickly. And we were very apprehensive because I've never come across this situation. In reality, it turned out to be a 20-minute job because the subscap split was all done. It was still raw. So we just had to go in. The graft was just lying there waiting to be picked up, removed the head end, ignored the parent screws inside the bone, and just ensured that our screws are not clashing with those previous screws. And that's the challenge. If your first screw is exactly in the lower sector, then that can be a big challenge because the next time it's going to be suboptimal. But this time, we actually used the C arm, didn't open, and confirmed for ourselves that everything is sitting well and the graft's going well. And then subsequently went ahead and did a CT scan four months later, and we confirmed that everything is sitting beautifully healed up, fortunately. He's doing well now. He's uh, almost two years and over and well followed up. But again, as JC said, your neurologist, the teamwork, ensure that there's compliance. He should understand from this that you should never give up on the meds. And open division is probably the most optimal choice, but you need a backup of allograft or IC joint. Uh, sir, can I have a word on this? Yeah. Sir, sir uh, did the thought run into your mind that because this was a case uh, uh, subsequent to an ep epileptic uh, episode, there could be a fracture in the scapula or some in the bone in the scapula was not probably no, 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 good Abhishek. enough for a In fact, I'm going to allude to something else because we had a nice discussion in Cape Town with Shekhar Srivastava. He's here somewhere. And uh, the issue was, and this is interesting, Dave and JC, that when you use a latage in an epileptic and they have a violent seizure, that biceps will avulse the graft big time. So the suggestion was to use uh, ICBG graft in epileptics primarily so that even if they have an epilepsy, the graft will stay in place and may not get avulsed. So that was a very different perspective came in. And so since then, when we've had epileptics and especially the ones who are not reliable, we prefer not to do the latage and just prefer ICBG or a allograft in those patients. So that was the discussion that came through. Ashish. Karthik. Yeah. Uh, did, did it ever cross your mind why did the uh, graft fail at the screw, um, that the screw broke rather than just the graft towels and the screw stays, which is what is the normal thing. I mean, after, after about three or four months or five months down the line, when, the, um, when such, a, such a failure occurs, usually the graft, the piece of the graft towel says, but the screw stays. Let me stop you there. Yeah. There's a big difference between seventh day post-op and three months post-op. Three months post-op screw breakage means non-union. Yeah. Seventh no. day, it's not what, expected what to I, unite. What I mean is the screw, um, probably because of the big cannula, cannulation, the screw is probably weak or probably in epileptics we should use a solid screw. Will, will that be a... Well, he was positioned for arthral latage. You can't do that without a CC screw. The CC screws are hollow, vulnerable. They're not meant for sustaining such violence. If an epilepsy is going to have a fit before the graft is united, something's got to give. When an immovable force meets uh, uh, unbeatable force, something has got to give. Ash, would the take-home message be do a latage for an epileptic? Or why wouldn't you consider a soft tissue procedure with a ramiplasage? I thought the take-home message should be do an ICBG graft in an epileptic rather than a latage. Because the conjoint tendon being attached will get avulsed for sure because it's a very powerful muscle there. 
So we agreed with that. We had a very nice discussion. That's a good thing that came out. The reason I put it in here was we never think about it. We just look at bone loss. We diagnose that well. We did not give enough credibility to his epilepsy. And that can happen any time. So perhaps if it was an ICBG, it would not have dislocated or screws would not have broken. Ashish, I think, uh, just, just to tell you Daniel. that uh, we have discussed this for a long time with uh, s several surgeons, especially Wayne Burhead, and he has always considered a contraindication of Latache uh, having a patient with epilepsy. So I think that's a very good message mm. to consider yep. that if you need to add a, a graph, it is better not to perform a lateral jet. That's right. That's right. Super. Let's move swiftly to the next case. This is a 35-year-old lady, known rheumatoid with DMARDS, uh, well-controlled rheumatoid uh, in remission for years. Left shoulder pain aggravated after a fall. And then, since then, she's had night pain, morning stiffness, barometric joint. Uh, she said that over her two pregnancies over two years, she started deteriorating, and her shoulders coming down is getting more and more stiff. Uh, that's her range of movement. Uh, on the X-rays, I don't know whether it's projecting, but she has concentric OA there. Um, bone quality looks okay, but she's lost her complete cartilage. And that's about her external rotation. Um, she was given a steroid injection in theater, and that gave her relief for about three and a half weeks, and then everything came back to the same level. Um, you could see her wins uh, when she had those extreme movements. Uh, these are her MRI scans. You can see there's a huge uh, synovial reaction there, very typical of a rheumatoid uh, joint. And uh, the cuff looks intact, but there's severe inflammation. Uh, her cuff looks okay. The T1 sizes are satisfactory. Um, primary OA, glenoid, no retroversion, 35, rheumatoid. How do you want to proceed? Samuel. So I think that the only predictable way of treating this patient is replacing the shoulder. Any other thing that you can offer, it's a coin thrown in the air to see if it helps. But in my hands, she would be a candidate for a total shoulder replacement. I would replace the glenoid and the humeral head. And in this specific group and age, I would uh, rather use a stemless implant and a, and a standard uh, glenoid component. I, I think the calf is OK. As you said, it's inflammatory reaction and, and synovial fluid into the joint. But I would expect a weak, thin calf, but functional. So 35 is not such a big deal for you? No, because hmm. you never know how long you're going to live. Hmm. And I, the only thing I can deliver health to this lady is by doing something that is predictable. Yeah. Hmm. JC, you want to think? Um, well, I, probably the ultimate end would be what Samuel just said. But um, I have a few patients exactly like that when in arthroscopic debridement and uh, it saves sometimes. Some people go very long, hmm. uh, several years. I had uh, some 31-year-old female uh, like that, and she's still not back, so uh, that's already a couple of years ago. And so I think arthroscopic uh, debridement with taking out everything just slows a little bit and, and has a good pain relief also. So. Uh, I just recommend arthroscopic first, and if it fails within one or two years, you can have hmm. total or, or reverse or whatever. So in your Doesn't experience, it? how long can you pull them out with arthroscopic? Well, I didn't look back my series. Maybe I go back, I'll look at it. But I, I remember, I, I definitely remember a tw some 20-year-old like that female uh, six or seven years ago, and she's still not back. So I think if, if it was both shoulder. And, and then I have another patient like this uh, that I did. And I'm waiting another patient like this uh, a, few month, a few days ago that came. So uh, I think we can buy some time. I'm mm. not sure how long. Uh, I'll, I don't have a data right now, but I'll look it up. And yeah, I'm sure. sure it's going to be a few years. Yeah. And so when you counsel these patients preoperatively, what do you tell them uh, to expect improvement in pain, movement, strength? They, they, they both. They definitely have pain relief. Pain relief. Yes. That's primary, and that's what you would counsel them to. Sure. Ram? Uh, 
Um, I have few rheumatoid uh, younger age, but not 35. Around 45, I have done. Uh, I think this uh, arthritis is a little bit more advanced for arthroscopic procedure only, uh, because if there is some cartilage left on the glenoid, then okay, you can go ahead. But uh, I would do a stemmed total shoulder platform type, because with the stemless, the, the metaphyseal bone will not be very good. Uh, but I have, I will always have a backup of reverse. <laughs> I wouldn't say that because I have done uh, reverse for a 45-year-old severe rheumatoid. I'm hesitating uh, for a total and you're bringing oh, reverse no. into this See, basically, discussion. Basically, that, that top cuff doesn't look good it, to it me. Is, uh, the tenderness yeah, part say, is not I so I good, I just but, said, yeah. but the T1 side is brilliant. Yeah, that's fine. I just say I go with the plan of total shoulder, stemmed platform type. Uh, but I'm just telling that, you know, in case right. uh, situation scenario where the cuff is very bad, then, you know, otherwise you'll be like a again continuing uh, to have pain. You're a true-blooded surgeon. You're, you've got a lion heart. I felt I had to get so much courage to tell her that, see, we we've, we've gave her a lot of uh, conservative trial, pulled her on, didn't work. And uh, I agree with Samuel that we planned for a stimulus for her. And we said that's your best option, really speaking. Uh, there were concerns because of the poor bone quality and all. It was very important to match the sizes uh, this is an evolutive stemless, uh, which has a cap and a base, and it's very important to put it back in as anatomically as possible. And so we use uh, CMs to find on the trial because I need to be absolutely precise on where it is sitting because uh, if the stemless goes wrong, then it's bad news. Uh, you have to balance them out perfectly, and if that happens, then... Uh, that's the kind of result. And this is just seven month follow up for this lady. And she's thrilled for the first time in the last two, three years. Uh, she's had so much of relief. They require a lot of releases because you need to balance uh, and restore the length tension relationship between the rotators and the external rotators, internal rotators. And you need to deal with the capsule very diligently. And once you're happy, then you do the trial, do the dynamic trial, and I actually use a CM. It's very unconventional, but I like to ensure because sometimes uh, you're not happy. That's your best time to change. You don't want to come out post-op and then find out that this situation. I think uh, we'll do one last case before we... Sir, uh, just a word. Is, uh, is there any role of interposition, arthroplasty, like a pyrocarbon or... Interposition? Yeah. Uh, to buy time, what Professor Yu just spoke about. Interposition. Uh, anybody in the faculty think interposition has a role, experience? I, the only person I know was Joe DeBeer, who did it for young arthritics, and that was like uh, 12 years back. And when we saw some of his results, I spent time with him. They were very iffy. Um, there were some patients who were reasonably happy, no movements restored, and some patients were absolutely gutted. And it's like you've done one surgery, one scar, and so, and you can't give a meaningful answer to the patient as to what he is to expect from this. Boof, you have something on your mind? I, mean, I have no personal experience, but I have seen being done and the results, although published, I don't think they truly reflect Martin Snow in RH. Uh, he's done quite a few of biological resurfacement. Who's using this? Martin Snow. Martin Smith. Martin Snow. Snow. Hmm. Uh, so he's used a TFL or uh, other type of allografts. I was there for the first few cases. I've seen a lot of infection, and I don't think it was any uh, reason to be justified, so I'm not mm. con convinced uh, the interposition or yeah. biological yeah. grafts. Yeah. That one. Yeah. Dave. Ash, I have a question because I don't have much experience in stemless. If you, re you look at this on CT scan, if you decide you're not happy and re remove it and replace it in a different position. Can you get enough fixation or do you have to go to stem prosthesis then? Well, there are two things. Is the rotations that I can change uh, on the offsets, but I always have a stem prosthesis on the back table in case, especially the avian patients, if they tend to have a big cyst underneath the head, sometimes you just put your center hole and then it just goes and explodes into a big hole. It's a strict no-no. Uh, with this process, you need at least 75% coverage on the head, which should reliably sit in. And when I'm doing that C, uh, C arm, I'm actually doing dynamic movement. So I'm not interested in static x-rays. Uh, dynamically, I must see there's no micro motion. It sits beautifully. It's uncemented. I don't like cement in there. And uh, the, the short-term results we've had have been very exciting. 
But if the bone quality is suspect, and that's typically when we see AVN, I don't hesitate like Ram that I would just take it out and move ahead. But there should be no micro motion. And that's why I'm more interested in the dynamics. On a total or a reverse, I may not use a CRM, but with the stemless, I always have the CRM in place because it gives you a perspective that you don't have. And then three months later, you find out, oh, there's sinking, especially on to virus. It's, it's a poor sign, and it's too late to change anything. So that was the idea. OK, this is a 27-year-old. We've got too many young patients here. And she comes from uh, the north of uh, Maharashtra. Uh, she was referred by a surgeon. Uh, she had restricted movements of five months, sudden onset. And no trauma, nothing in the history. Uh, she's from Barhanpur, and she had a lot of night pain. Uh, um, uh, she said she had three days of fever, but we're not quite sure about that. There was no constitutional sign symptoms. Actively, she had only 70, 70, uh, forward flexion, 70 degrees abduction, just 10 degrees external notation, and down to the buttocks. Looked like a typical frozen shoulder or a osteoarthritis patient, and uh, that was her picture. That was a picture. So it was AVN for sure. We looked and digged into her past history and went deeper. Uh, there was no history of steroid abuse. There's, uh, of course, she said, there's no question of alcohol. We couldn't find the primary reason for her AVN. Incredible pain and a uh, lot of dysfunction because she had only 70 degrees movement. She comes from a province which is almost, I think, 500 kilometers from here. And uh, it's a very atypical AVN because the changes are going all the way down as such. Um, any thoughts, Karthik? She has no sickling? No sickle cell. No, no idea. It's certainly not classic AVN. No history. That fever was vague. Uh, we did her CRPs. Her CRPs were normal, very young. OK, since Boov has mentioned this, um, she comes from Barhanpur, which is uh, on the border of Maharashtra and um, Madhya Pradesh. And that is a sickle belt. That is a sickle belt. That's a known sickle belt. I have worked in that area. That's why I knew that. So I just had a suspicion. And we just did a sickle test and a CRP. CRPs were normal. And her uh, MRIs were so atypical. Uh, there was dense changes all the way down. You don't get avian changes down into the marrow as such. And there was a lot of inflammation there. And so we got a sickle test positive. She was a sickler. So uh, this was, we just came off there, off the top of my head. It's very unusual to see them. And she's not a tribal, really speaking, but there must be some genetic uh, transmission between the families. And sickle means bad news. So what now, Bhuv? You did well. <laughs> 27 sickle, disabled. I mean, they, they, they usually are in severe pain, and obviously we need to get the sickling under control. And obviously you need a good hematology backup, uh, and then if you decided to do surgery, then obviously it's, it's a full, full Monty. Uh, what so surgery? I, uh, when, like, I think if you, if you control the sickling, and if she's not in severe she's pain. She's not had a crisis. Oh, she's not had a crisis. She's not had a crisis. OK. I mean, I think you go run through the options. I mean, I think could core come, uh, decompression be considered? Uh, I think the disease is quite extensive, running into the uh, stem, in, into the uh, stem as well. So I'm not sure the significance of that, but I mean, it could certainly be considered. There was a thought that went across, but because it was atypical AVN and it was descending down to the marrow, my worry was by doing a decompression, would I make her worse because of the poor bone quality, and there have been some reports of core decompression where it has aggravated the disease because the bone was compacted and just sunk through. So I wasn't sure about that. And the report and literature on avian and humerus is very sparse. Uh, nothing in the peer-reviewed literature. Yes, Ram. I, I agree that this is not a classical avian. And uh, I have seen similar picture with the decompression sickness where you have a head uh, collapse as well as the medullary in, infarct. Scuba divers. Scuba divers. I have seen that. Uh, the patient was age was about 40. 
but this patient is a little bit younger, so I would, do a, I would do a stemmed hemi, hemiarthroplasty. Hmm. Uh, I don't do the full Monty here because the glenoid is okay. Yes, and the glenoid the, looked okay. On glenoid the looks okay. On the hmm. stemless, will not stand hmm. here, hmm. so stemmed hemiarthroplasty. Hmm. Yeah, it's uh, certainly not a candidate for stemless. Depends, uh, depends on the purchase. If it's a good uh, holding, you can still do uncemented, but mostly cemented. So we went deeper down and studied sickling for this patient. Uh, Dr. Sudhir Babu from Nagpur has a lifetime work on sickling, so I had easy access to him. And we discussed, uh, for whatever happens, you must prevent the crisis, which means do not allow them to have any form of dehydration. Uh, acidosis, so soda bicarb. Uh, there are some yeasts uh, which have to be provided to them to negate the acidosis and uh, keep them hydrated all the time. Give them a lot of vitamins and vitamin C's to build up their bone strength. And uh, we both agreed that because she was 27, I think we should give her a trial of rehab and see what it happens and monitor her every six months because the bone has to become dense again. It would. And the reversal of the AVN or the revascularization follows a very different cycle in sickle cell anemia as opposed to the focal AVN that we see conventionally. And uh, we actually uh, did well. I have a video somewhere. It didn't show up here. And she was much better, almost 60-70% after a two-week exercise program. We've improved her movements to 120, 120, uh, 30 external rotation. And we said we will keep a watch on her. So we've sent her back. Uh, she will come to us every three months to just monitor. So far, we've uh, skipped the crisis. Uh, hopefully, we can monitor her. If she does well, we can buy another two, three years of her time and then move on. Uh, the last case, uh, young man, 51 years old, and no proximal migration, very poor movements. And uh, he's had pain for a few years. He remembers a trauma long, long back. A lot of pain, especially at night, a lot of disability. Um, he has a workshop where he has to work physically, and he's not been able to do that. Okay, we'll skip that now. Um, he's had three steroid injections with no relief from the last steroid injection, and uh, cuff was grade three power. Uh, there's nothing there. There's just no cuff there at all. He's a massive, irreparable cuff there. Absolutely massive. So, reasonable uh, subscap there. That's probably why he did not have a proximal migration. Young guy. Cartilage looks good. And that's the status of his cuff. That's the biceps. That's, that's only biceps left there. There's no cuff tissue at all. And that's complete bald head. Everything is exposed. This is a 50 mm supraspinatus tear. Typical 1D Philip Collin, where mainly the supra and infra are affected. It's gone down to the glenoid completely. So we have option. I mean, nothing's going to work. He's 51. Uh, we have to offer him. MRI, I don't have them here. But on the MRI, it's a 50 mm tear. The T1 Sag, he's got Gutlier 3. Uh, he's got almost 50% wasting on the supra infra uh, focally. The subscap is very good, dense, isodense, uh, zero gutilier on the subscap. Hybrid. Active external rotation of 30 degrees. On the, no, no lag, no lag. But, but, uh, MRI would be very helpful, but. Uh, I, I think uh, just looking at the, your scope, uh, we didn't mobilize it and you know everything, but um, I think either you could do a partial or a hybrid, I think, and that's that would be my options. Or maybe if you're 
if a terror if terror was here, he'll probably do repair and SCR. <laughs> Brave. Yes, Ram. Uh, either go for medialized to footprint repair. If you can bring it, it was just stiff. There was nothing. There was no if, chance uh, for a partial repair. Okay. Um, it was so stiff that it would come up 10 mm beyond the glenoid. That's it. Then it uh, wouldn't be good. Extensively so mobilized. Option, yeah. option is either lat dorsi transfer or superior capsule reconstruction. I would prefer now to do superior capsule reconstruction, but with fascia later. Right. So given that the indications of the lat dorsi transfer and superior capsule are pretty it's much pre identical. Pretty much identical. Same. So. How do you decide which is which? Yes, Karthik. Oh. Uh, um, how was his teres minor on the MR? See, I, teres I used, minor was good. I should look at uh, compensatory teres minor. It was hypertrophy teres minor. So in that case, uh, no wasting. Yeah. So in that case, the superior capsule will still work well, uh, or we can go for lat dorsi. So it's 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 the surgeon's choice. You're not betting on one or the either side. You're covering I, both. I would actually range. do a lat dorsi. You'd, I would you'd like to do a lateral yeah. sign. Sure. Sure. Boom. I'd, superior SCR. SCR. I might put a balloon to prevent proximal migration. Just, I don't know, I mean, I, in UK I did few of this. Just putting a balloon on top for a few months, I, I don't know whether it's going to work or not. Somehow, x rays post stop six, after six months. Uh, there is less proximal migration if I augment it with a balloon on subarachnoid space after So there's SCR. no migration here at all? True, but it prevents. Would you prevent still birth. use the balloon? No, not in this case. In this case, I would do SCR alone. Yeah, yeah. Dave, you have the thoughts? Um, yes, um, I've always considered myself a midterm adapter when it comes to newer things. So I have some trepidation about the rush to do superior capsule reconstructions. And I noticed when I was on my way over here, I was looking at a video from one of the companies that said um, SCR, the new gold standard. So I question that, but this would be an indication for me to consider doing an SCR because of the patient's young age and because of his uh, heavy type of work. So I don't think he's uh, indicated for an arthroplasty. I think a lat dorsate transfer, at least for me, has been in unpredictable who does well and who doesn't. I haven't figured out that. So I, I think you're burning no bridges uh, if you don't have a complication with an SCR. So on an SCR, would you choose a synthetic graph? Would you choose... An IT band, would you choose an allograft? In the United States, I don't know anybody who's using um, autograft. I think everybody's... Autograft? Uh, no, I don't, I don't know anybody who is. I think everybody's gone to uh, acellular dermal grafts. Even though the data supports that, uh, you know, at least what's published is probably what Mahat is doing with a bigger graft works better. Sure. JC, Daniel, do you have a choice between what graft? Um, we, we, we in Korea you can do both. I think half and half are doing half and half. Uh, half and half. I just I just do allograft because uh, the time. It's just personal reasons, the time frame, and you know you need someone to prepare another thirty minutes or something, and and the patient complains a lot <laughs> on the thigh or something. complains about uh, you know it, the donor the side? side sometimes sometimes. Yes, Daniel. What about the biceps tendon? Is there? The biceps tendon is intact. Is intact. And the patient, how much pain and how much stiffness? Because if it is my shoulder, I prefer to just attempt to a biceps tenotomy and a good rehab. And I always have time for a, an SCR or whatever. Sure. I just want to add one thing. Uh, in, in Korea right now, biceps SCR is becoming a big boom. So uh, one other option would be partial repair. Reverse with, biceps tenodesis. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, biceps repair, biceps SCR, uh, partial repair biceps SCR yeah. would be yeah. my choice. Yeah. So, uh, my question is, uh, you have done off half a fascia later on the synthetic dermal matrix graft. No, 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 I didn't do it. It's just Korean population. Korean population. Korean what, what is it? Okay, okay. What is the difference in... Uh, Ram, can MRI? you speak up into the mic? Sorry. What is the difference in MRI healing of the graft between the two? Um, because the original Mihata series is over 90% healing. With yeah, fascia later. Yeah. Well, we I don't think, get the same with the uh, dermal graft. Um, it's a very good question, but I don't think it's too early to answer your questions because 
the SCR, um, Teru has been doing it for five to 10 years. Most of the rest of the world uh, just been doing it within two years. And, and some of them don't have MRIs. And so I think eventually we'll have that results within, four, within five years, I think. Yeah. Ram, you're questioning the healing between the IT band and allograft. Uh, allograft. The dermal matrix, synthetic. Human Synthetic. Yeah. Synthetic so just to rephrase everybody, we are still unsure. Um, uh, USA, they have allografts, and Ram was questioning whether the synthetic graft is as good as the autograft, which is the eyelutable band that Tero Mihata propagated. And uh, JC says that in Korea, uh, half the surgeons are preferring to cut the tendon biceps in the groove, keep this glenoid part intact, and reinsert the distal half of the proximal biceps into the greater tuberosity. So it's a long enough biceps SCR kind of technique. Um, so you can see there's a lot of variation. As JC said, except for Mihata, all the others are pretty greenhorns. They have come into doing these over the last two years, and we don't have correct answers. I don't know what is the correct answer. And so we chose to do an SCR for this gentleman. Um, if I do an SCR, I have very little faith on synthetic graphs. And the synthetic graphs available here are porcine. Uh, we'd rather have a human dermal allograft, which is not available, requires a cold chain, FDA permissions not available in India. Uh, so we took an IT band. Like Teru, uh, following from Teru and inspired by him, I like to sandwich this into a thick 8 mm sandwich, which makes it very difficult because it's going to occupy the whole subacromial area completely there. But this is what we achieved. Um, we uh, managed to close the whole defect. We had two metal anchors on the glenoid side. Uh, for SCR, I prefer metal anchors on the glenoid side and the bio anchors on the humeral side. And we had a double row repair on the lateral side. We've closed the whole curtain completely. And uh, we've achieved so far so good. And he came a year and a half later. Every year, he's been asked to come. And this is 18 months later. I. Um, we don't have his pre-ops to compare, but he had a grade three gutelier on his supra-infra, and this is stunning. I, I'm still equivocal and equipoised on the usefulness of SCR, and I'm neutral to it, but this is his 18 months later uh, T1 SAG image, and I, I can't explain this at all. Uh, his movements are almost 70, 80% there. He's not perfect. His strength is okay. His pain is... 90% gone, he still has 10% pain, but this was incredible. I couldn't believe that the, there was a reversal of Gutelier. I can understand reversal of Gutelier in somebody who has a massive cuff tear, but somebody who's, who has an interposition graph, which is not a dynamic transfer, is just inexplicable. So we'll watch this space. Everything is not done. We're still buying time. I don't think this is a complete answer to this gentleman, but this is an incredible. You can see the graft is still surviving one and a half years later. It's still intact, uh, screws in position so well. That's pretty much what we wanted to discuss today. Thank you very much for your patience.